as a bit of an introduction, uh, my name's Alex de Koning. Um, I've been a part uh, of Just Stop Wild for the last couple of years. Uh, I am a PhD climate scientist. I'm studying green hydrogen production. Um, and I'm, I'm just really glad to be here, to be honest, hosting this, because uh, as, as anyone in science, uh, like anything remotely related to climate science right now will tell you, one of the most jarring things is the sort of the distortion between how bad the climate science really is and how nobody's talking about it. That's the thing I find most despairing of just that it's just constantly this elephant in the room, even among scientific conferences and whatnot. So the fact that we're able to have this discussion, I, I find incredibly hopeful um, and, uh, and positive because only a, once we're all on the same page, I feel like can we actually start making some progress and when you, you know, you don't get chemotherapy unless you know that you have cancer. And um, that's uh, an analogy I always like to use. So um, I've, I'm really happy to be able to introduce you to the three speakers that we have. We have uh, Professor Sir David King, uh, Professor Haley Fowler, and then finally Roger Hallam. Each speaker is gonna be speaking for about five minutes and then we're gonna open it into uh, a, a panel discussion. So uh, we will be around 20 minutes. Um, I, I have a couple of questions I'm very excited to ask, but please put your own questions in the chat. Um, and one of the co-hosts um, will take note and we'll, we'll go through as many as we, as we can. So without further ado, I am hoping, and then afterwards, we're going to go into breakout rooms. These are completely optional, but if you'd like to have a bit more of a discussion afterwards, find out how you can get involved um, in Just Stop Oil or find out more about the climate science, then please stick around for that. Vitally, there's going to be a poll beforehand, um, which is really useful information for us and also gives you a bit of an idea of how you can get more involved in Just Stop Oil. Um, I'll go through these details later on. So without further ado, I want to introduce Sir, uh, Professor Sir David King to talk for five minutes. Uh, there's a lot I could say to introduce uh, Dave King, a well-respected emeritus professor of chemistry at the University of Cambridge, um, UK government chief scientific advisor for seven years between two, the year 2000 and 2007, foreign secretary's special representative on climate change for four years, um, is very vocal on climate action, initiated several important programs, um, including launching uh, a global team of climate experts to form the Climate Crisis Advisory Group, which is going to be a link for later. And I could go on for a long time, but without further ado, please welcome um, Dave King. Alex, thank you very much. And what I'm going to do in my five minutes is just give a quick update on what the climate science is telling us is the current state of the earth. So the first thing is global temperature average rise last year, 2023, was between 1.46 and 1.48 degrees centigrade. That's a detailed analysis for the whole planet. Um, and that is a, a, a very big step ahead of any previous year uh, that we have recorded for the planet. So it's uh, it, it's rising very close to that 1.5. This, of course, is uh, exacerbated by the El Nino effect. But nevertheless, this is a very real concern. The second thing is that while the planet is up there at 1.48 above the pre-industrial level, um, the the average for the planet doesn't tell us about local temperature rises. And the biggest threat uh, is really coming from what's happening in the Arctic Circle region. The Arctic Circle over the last 15 to 20 years has been heating up at roughly four times the rate of the rest of the planet and is now well over three degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. And there are a number of tipping points that have, concerns have been expressed about that are re related to what's happening in the Arctic Circle region and that will impact and are already now impacting on the whole planet. So let me just take you through the latest data that was just published last week. Uh, showing that Greenland, sitting up there in the Arctic Circle, 
is now losing 30 million tons of ice per hour. And when I say now, I mean averaging over the last 35 years. Today, it's losing it faster than it was 35 years ago, of course. Um, over the last 35 years or 38 years, Greenland has lost 1 trillion metric tons of ice. Now, these measurements are, are based on a very detailed analysis of uh, satellite measurements, and the, there is no question about what is happening there. I'm afraid it does look very much as if Greenland is now losing ice quite possibly irreversibly. And I say quite possibly it may stop at some point in the future, but I don't think anyone knows what is the mechanism for stopping it that is natural, in other words, without human intervention. Uh, what this means in the uh, longer run is even looking askance at any other cause of rising sea levels, the Arctic uh, region will be responsible for a 7.5 meter sea level rise. That's 24 feet sea level rise. It may take a, a few hundred years, but even by the end of the century, we have to anticipate a sea level rise in the region of two to three meters above the present level. But in the Arctic Circle, we also have a vast amount of methane trapped in the methane hydrate on land. And we've known for the last, uh, well, since 2015, we've known that uh, uh, methane is being lost explosively, particularly from northern Siberia. And this wasn't a prediction from the climate community. We've been very careful about not predicting the amount of methane that is currently being emitted, but we are now aware of the fact that it could happen explosively on a very extensive scale. If the methane that is trapped in there were emitted over, for example, a 20-year period, the global temperatures would probably rise by about 5 to 8 degrees centigrade. So these two threats for the whole planet sitting there in that uh, polar region uh, but I, I think I need to also mention the jet stream. The jet stream, this circular wind blowing around the North Pole region, that jet stream is now very severely distorted by the fact that during the polar summer, there is warm air now over the North Pole region, over the Arctic Sea, which is exposed to sunlight, whereas the ice was reflecting it back into space. And... This means, this distortion means that we're seeing uh, weather changes around the planet that have been totally unexpected. These weather changes are leading to temperature rises, 5 to 10 degrees centigrade in some places higher than any previous record. For example, 2021, I spoke to a member of the Climate Crisis Advisory Group who is based on the permafrost in northern Finland, I, I spoke to him in April that year, and I said, how is it there? What's the temperature? And he said, it's, it's damn cold. It's about minus 30 degrees centigrade. But we can expect it to come up to about minus 10, which would be normal. I spoke to him the same year, just uh, less than three months later, the end of July, and he said to me, the temperature, the air temperature here today is plus 32 plus 32 over the permafrost within the Arctic Circle region. There's the big threat that we're faced with from that, uh, from that region. Now, if I take you on from the extreme weather events that have been observed right around the planet, whether I talk about the worst forest fires in Canada, again on record, or the worst forest fire in Europe, in, in Greece uh, during the summer, followed by a tremendous storm and rainfall in a, a very productive agricultural area in northern Greece. We're looking at challenges to the way human beings survive and live occurring on an extreme pattern around the world. This is the uh, just a snapshot of where we are. We also know, of course, that during 2023, the Antarctic region lost a, a large proportion of its sea ice. And it hasn't been doing that for many years. 
uh, and of course the climate science community working on the Antarctic are extremely worried because the warm water around the Antarctic region means faster loss of ice from Antarctica as well. Let me just say now a few words about what should be done about this. Jim Hansen uh, spoke to the United Nations Senate in 1989, and what he basically said was, this is a real danger to the well-being of humanity, and we need to act fast. 1989, those were his words, act fast. I was brought in as chief scientific advisor, as you've heard, to the British government in the year 2000, and I felt we still had time uh, and rapid emissions reduction was my sole focus. Um, the, uh, during the premiership of Tony Blair, he took a lot of notice of what I was saying. And we actually have, since 1990, we've reduced our uh, uh, emissions uh, by 48%. And this is a, a very significant factor because in when I moved into negotiating on behalf of Britain in the climate negotiations, we could say, this is what we're doing domestically. What are you going to do? So it was a, we're saying what we were doing domestically, planning to reduce our emissions at that point by 80% by 2050, we were saying the rest of the world has to follow suit. Now, we haven't followed suit. We are still exceeding every year the previous year's amount of greenhouse gases emitted. Um, and so we are now emitting, let's count in methane. We often forget to do that. We're emitting about 50 billion tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere on an annual basis and still rising. So what, what we must do is no longer just base our future on reduction, but that is a sine qua non. Without doing this action of reducing, frankly, we're cooked. But we've put up too much greenhouse gases there. Look at what's happening in the Arctic Circle region. We have to remove excess greenhouse gases and bring it down to from 500 parts per million where we are today to something like 350 parts per million as we move forward uh, in time. How do we buy time to do that? We also have to learn how to refreeze the Arctic. And my fourth R, these are the uh, strategy, this is the strategy put forward by the Climate Crisis Advisory Group is resilience. Each part of the world needs to develop resilience. So in general, let me just say, climate change is the biggest challenge our civilization has ever had to face up to. We now have an emergency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so David King, that's, yeah, always really sobering to hear you talk. And there's so many questions I want to ask, but I will do so later at the panel, which I'm very excited about. I am now going to pass on to Professor Haley Fowler. I, just as a little bit of an introduction, but I'm sure Haley will tell you more herself. Um, she's a professor of climate change impacts at Newcastle University. Uh, with her research focusing on understanding changing precipitation extremes and, pro and providing better projections for climate adaptation. Basically, yeah, well, Hayley will tell you more. Uh, <laughs> uh, she is a contributing author to the IPCC report, the latest one, um, British Hydrological Society president for several years, um, advises the government for her roles on several boards that I um, don't have time to list. So I'm just going to pass to you instead. Thank you for joining us. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, and I'm not sure that I can follow Sir David um, in being so eloquent, but I'll try. Um, I'm gonna gonna do a similar thing to to what Sir David has done um, and lay out some of the science for you, um, but but concentrating much more on extremes and particularly talking about resilience, which is what he actually finished with, which wasn't um, wasn't planned. Um, so I mean. Just taking the the title of this panel, um, we we are, and I think we are in un, uncharted territory. We've seen extraordinary record breaking events all over the world in the last year, but certainly years before that as well. Um, this is continuing. You know, just in the last few days, we've seen heat records broken in South America and in Europe again. Um, and as a 
someone who works in climate science, and I've got a lot of colleagues who work in climate science as well, I would say that this rapid pace of change has surprised me. Um, it's it's very difficult to quantify statistically what's happening, right? And that's what we try and do as scientists. But it seems that the real world is changing much more rapidly than climate model projections indicate that it should be. And that's concerning. So Sir David or already talked about um, the fact that we almost broke this 1.5 degree um, ceiling, if you like, in 2023. We're very close. It's a single year, but almost... 50% of days last year had a global mean surface temperature, which was more than 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial mean. Um, and, you know, it's a single year, but for me, this is a real, really crucial sign that we, we need to make these rapid changes to the way we live, these rapid reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I, I agree, we, we also need to be thinking about removing greenhouse gases from the the, the system from the atmosphere. Um, we're certainly getting closer and closer to these tr critical tipping points in the climate system. Um, so David's all, all already mentioned um, the record-breaking heating in 2023, and, and obviously the main driver was the onset of the strong El Nino event that we saw um, that's still ongoing. Um, there's also an effect from increased water vapour in the atmosphere due to the Tonga eruption. I think that that's something that's 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 quite interesting and perhaps less certain is the influence of some regulatory changes that have mandated the use of low sulfur fuels in ocean shipping. Um, and this this came in in 2020. Um, but but actually this this reduction in sulfur over the oceans, these particles normally um, help the development of clouds. They act as cloud nuclei and they help to reflect solar radiation back to space, obviously the clouds. So, so the significant reduction in, in this sulfur over the ocean since 2020 has actually potentially contributed to the rapid warming as well. Um, and Jim Hansen was involved in a study recently, which is really interesting to read. And there's a lot of podcasts actually as well that you can, you can watch if you're interested that explain this in, in more simple terms. Um, and they've been looking at this real world experiment, you know, what, what happens if we reduce this damping effect of, of sulfur in the atmosphere? And this um, fairly terrifying, actually, or sobering, at least, um, it's enabled them to, to estimate that the climate system is much more sensitive to greenhouse gases than we previously thought. And they, they suggest, therefore, that warming will be much more rapid and significant by the end of the century and beyond. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is extremely um, sobering um, and concerning. Um, Alex has said already, my, my own research is on extreme weather events. And in particular, I look at extreme rainfall and flooding and how that is changing in observations um, and how, um, how, how will it continue to, to potentially change in the future. Um, I think the increase in global mean temperature in 2023 has played out in significant record breaking heat and, and wet events, as well as obviously dry events and forest fires. Um, we've seen exceptional heat waves, we've seen heat domes, they've been recorded worldwide, and it's not just in 2023, but it's been something that's been increasing over the past decade or so. Um, there's also been exceptional rainfall events that have led to record shattering, and I call it record shattering because it really is record shattering flooding. So um, to take just one example, I'm sure you all remember, um, Storm Daniel caused extensive flooding in Greece in September last year, and it produced three years of rainfall, three years of rainfall in two days over a large region in Greece. Um, and, and, you know, I find that in itself quite staggering. But then at that point, it actually moved offshore. It became a hurricane, a hurricane-like storm system in the Mediterranean. And we actually call these medicanes. And it hit Libya. Um, and you, you'll have seen this on the news, but it resulted in thousands of fatalities from two dams breaking above the city of Derna. Um, so the immediate cause was extreme rain. They had the equivalent of at least a year's rainfall in 24 hours. Um, and, and, you know, the, a town near to Derna reported over 400 millimetres in 24 hours. And to put this into perspective, Derna normally gets about 270 millimetres of rainfall a year, and it, it basically received nearly double the annual rainfall in only about six hours, right? Uh, you know, this, this, is, this is hugely concerning. 
these these are record shattering events. Um, it was obvious that the infrastructure in Derna could not stand up to that. Um, it's almost certainly due to a lack of investment in infrastructure as well. But how many how many of these dams could actually cope with these types of events? Um, there's been a number of these very extreme rainfall events around the world, not just this year or last year. Um, we need to expect these extreme events to become the norm. Um, climate models suggest that these events will become much more intense and much more frequent um, in the future as we move into this much warmer world. Um, Storm Daniel itself was, was actually something we call a cutoff low. So it was a low pressure system that became almost stationary. And that's to do with this, this, this extremely wavy jet stream that Sir David has already talked about. So the jet stream had a huge kink in it. Um, a huge heat wave developed over Europe at the same time. It's something that scientifically we call an omega block. Um, and that huge kink allowed this large heat wave to develop. Um, and then these 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 cut off low storms as well. So the irony, I suppose, of climate change um, and the irony of these extreme events is that while Central Europe was being roasted by this heat wave, both Spain and Greece were being pounded by extreme rainfall. Um, and we're not certain of the science yet. We're not certain um, that that climate change is making the jet stream more wavy and blocking more likely, but there's certainly indications that that is happening. And there are good scientific reasons why this may, might be the case. Um, and I think it's fundamentally un, important for, for thinking about climate resilience that we actually understand a lot more about these interconnections and how these extreme events are, are physically connected, because it might be important. This, the sequencing of these types of things is very important for impacts. Um, infrastructure systems are not fit for purpose. We've heard this in a number of reports in the UK and elsewhere um, from the National Infrastructure Commission and others. I know that Jim Hall was, was in the BBC News just yesterday stating this and restating this again. Um, there's not enough investment in climate resilience and adaptation. We, we've reached a point now where we cannot, as Sir David said, um, rely on mitigation alone. And we, we, we need to be thinking more and more about making making systems resilient to, to climate change. And, we, you know, we're taking baby steps in the UK at the moment um, in terms of, of this, um, in terms of different different sectors are more and less prepared, but, but really it's baby steps and we need to be doing much more. So to close, um, I believe we've reached a critical point. Um, we almost reached 1.5 degrees of warming in 2023, albeit it's a single year. It really should be setting alarm bells ringing. I'm actually very shocked by the extreme weather events I saw last year. Um, I've heard colleagues in climate science say they don't understand the rapid changes. More research is certainly needed, but uh, but um, you know we need to be thinking about lobbying governments um, to make systemic changes that we need in energy production, immediately curbing greenhouse gases and providing the visionary leadership we need in this space. Thank you, Hayley. Um, I'm just going to go straight on to Roger Hallam and then we'll have the discussion later. So for those of you who don't know Roger Hallam, he was a co-founder of the Things Rebellion and Just Stop Oil and the political party Bernie Pink. Um, he was an organic farmer for over 20 years and saw the impacts of the climate crisis decimating his, his land firsthand. So he spent four years studying the science of mass mobilization um, and then now became uh, one of the most prolific environmental activists in the UK at the moment. So it's a pleasure to have you, Roger. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, I presume everyone can hear me. <laughs> um, yes, well, the first thing I want to say is, uh, if it's not immediately obvious, what we're talking about is mass death, the mass death of human beings. And I think I don't feel comfortable talking about the degree of criminality that is happening at the present moment with regard to this act without acknowledging our complicity just through actually knowing what's going on. And I sort of feel like, in a sense, whatever we do in response to this call and in response to this information we have, we'll all be in some way morally complicit 
in the criminality that's going on. And I don't have an answer to that complicity, but I think it's only human to acknowledge it. And similarly, I don't feel there's any adequate emotional response to such a level of criminality. And it's important to acknowledge that whatever we say is hopelessly inadequate in terms of acknowledging the emotional impact that this information is having and will increasingly have on on the world's population. Um, so that's what I want to start off saying before I move into the sort of morbid science of mass murder, as it were. Um, I'm not a trained natural scientist, so apologies if you're expecting someone <laughs> who has all the right letters after their name. But I do have a social scientific training, having done research at King's College in London. And what I'm going to say to you is really 101 social science. And it's something that isn't at all recognised when we talk about the natural science, as I'll come on to explain. I do want to say one or two things about how bad it is, which is the subject of this call. As a social scientist, I'm more interested in the speech of scientists than the science itself. And what's interesting, as some of you may know, is about four or four years ago now, I was on a hard talk on the BBC when I um, was honest enough to say that billions of people are going to die. And um, I was told by various BBC professionals on air that I'd made the number up. But I was only, as far as I was concerned, giving a, a street talk translation of what scientists have been saying for 30 years. You know, the end of civilization presumably means billions of deaths, doesn't it? Or am I wrong? I don't know. But what's interesting is the word billion has not been used by scientists until maybe 18 months ago. And as some of you may know, the word billion came up in, with regard to the future of the human niche uh, uh, paper and similar papers saying at two degrees centigrade, one billion people will be refugees. Well, presumably hundreds of millions of those people will die if you know about the social science of mass migration. Um, and then last August, a paper came out saying that two degrees, uh, the rich of the world will be responsible, quote, for killing one billion mainly poor people. Um, and then a few weeks ago, I think only two weeks ago, another paper came up which said that there's one billion people living in places which have no uh, effective response to wet bulb effect events, which again, as you may know, kill people within six hours when temperature and humidity uh, reach a certain tipping point. So what I would suggest is an alternative social scientific way of, of discussing how bad it will be will, will to, would be to do a chart of how often scientists use the word billion. And if we, you know, slightly uh, provocatively move that, that graph forward, we can say there will be an exponential increase in the number of times scientists use the word billions of deaths. And maybe some of them will be courageous to say, that those people will be killed in so much as this is an act of human agency. It's not a natural disaster. Um, the other thing to say is that there's good reason to believe that the situation is a lot worse than it actually is because of the structural conservatism of scientists. And there's a number of methodological and sociological reasons for that. Um, I don't wish necessarily to get into a big discussion about it, but I think it's irrefutable, the evidence that scientists continually underestimate what's happening, not least you can do a, a sort of back of envelope analysis of how many times in articles it says scientists were surprised by X. And again, you could do a textual analysis of that, which I think would be useful. Um, I think the most terrifying uh, reason for scientists' um, conservatism is because of what is rather complicatedly called nonlinear 
uh, nonlinear um, feedbacks within the system. And it's actually very difficult using normal language to communicate that A doesn't cause B, but there's A, B, C, D and E, and they're all increasing and they all affect each other. And that creates a nonlinear takeoff in all of those metrics. Um, and this could create a super exponential increase in global temperatures. And of course, because that's not certain, it's not discussed, but it's a very real possibility and a good explanation, of course, why scientists are continually surprised because they're trained in linear causality. A causes B rather than loads of different uh, elements within the system. So how bad is it going to be? Uh, we're heading for billions of deaths and we're heading for human extinction as the main scenario, I would suggest, as a social scientist. However, um, I would also like to do a bit of textual analysis, as it were, on the phrase, how bad will it be? The implication of that, of course, is bad, is un uncomplicatedly bad. It's not. If things get really bad, then things can get really good as well because humans respond to it. <laughs> you know, the world, world War II was a terrible event, but it led to the Bretton Woods Agreement and, you know, the social compact after World War II, which increased people's prosperity enormously. Um, so bad things lead to good things. And I think the real moral of the tale, as it were, is we're inevitably heading for a period of regime collapse and social collapse and social disruption. There's no doubt about that. And the real question is whether out of that process of social fluidity, as the phrase goes, we emerge with fascistic, nihilistic strategies which will lead to our extinction or will lead to revolutionary pro-social strategies that maintain some semblance of liberal civilization and compassion. That's me. Thank you, Roger. I was um, sobering to hear you talk. Um, there's a a lot to unpack here. So um, and there's a lot of questions that are coming in. Unfortunately, there's not time to go through all of them. I'm going to try and go through as many as possible. Um, so thanks for all joining me in the panel. I want to open by asking first, um, how should scientists be talking about um, the climate crisis? So I want to get opinions from um, all of you, if possible. Um, because, like, you know, we always hear about 1.5 degrees, sea level rise of 7.5 metres. It never sounds significant. And as, as we all saw, there was a big difference in how Roger spoke and how um, David King and, and Haley Fowler spoke. How, how can we equate these? Um, how should scientists be talking about the climate crisis? Who would like to go first? Um, I, I think the first thing I want to say is that the situation is dire. And I, I think we all agree on that. Uh, what I do want to say as well is I will never go out saying how terrible the situation is I, alone. I always want to be able to also say, but this is what we have to do. In other words, we have to give hope. If we simply signal that uh, we're going to see billions and billions of deaths, and I'm not disagreeing at all with the... Uh, statements that uh, were made by Roger. But I, I do think we've just got to be aware that many, many people are hoping that we will be able to demonstrate a way forward that avoids the worst of the challenges to humanity going forward. I, I think this is all we can do. We can sit down, and that's what the Climate Crisis Advisory Group has done. We're putting forward what the nature of the crisis is as seen by climate scientists, but alongside that, uh, a strategy for developing our ability to manage a future for humanity. And I just think that those two things always have to be coupled together in the public domain. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, Roger, you're right. I think scientists are naturally conservative. In, in the way they talk and the way they, you know, they're, they're naturally cautious about coming to conclusions. And that's partly the way they're trained. Um, but I do think that there are many scientists now who are standing up and saying that it is a crisis. And yes, we're, we are in a dire situation. 
Um, the science is settled, you know. I don't think I'm not I'm not even convinced anymore that it's about communicating the science, actually. Um I I I do think that those people in charge know that there is a problem. They're just choosing not to do anything about it. Um so it's it's in some ways, it's how do you move beyond the science? Um, is it is it for scientists to to do this, or is it about the whole of society in partnership actually trying to make these changes and trying to to force these changes? Perhaps um, you know I, I know I know the methods that that just stop oil use. Um, I I choose to to take a different path um, in terms of trying to advise government and talking to the media whenever I can and trying to get that message out there. Um, but there's lots of different paths that people can take. And, you know, um, I, so, I mean, I, I guess I guess what I'm saying is um, scientists are naturally conservative. I think we probably need to think a bit more about being less conservative um, in our messaging. But I also believe that a lot of scientists now are being less conservative in their messaging. Um, and I still don't think that messaging is getting across, actually, to the people that matter. So I I'm I'm not sure how we how we move forwards beyond this. But yeah, it's it's about giving people hope as well, because you know, we I, I firmly believe that we have time to solve this. Um we, we we're certainly getting less and less time. Um and uh, you know, we we're we're up against it, but but ingenuity, if we actually put the same sort of resource into this problem that we put into making weaponry and things in World War II, you know, we would actually have a good chance a fighting chance uh yes well <laughs> it's good to speak for quite a while about this topic uh i mean it would be appropriate and uh for scientists to show more emotion it would be appropriate for scientists to use plain language it would be appropriate for scientists to engage in civil disobedience all those things are probably you know everyone probably knows that's what i would say but I think what particularly I want to fo would want to focus on is, is as a social scientist, I have enormous respect for natural science and natural scientists, and I have enormous trust for their judgment. You know, I'm not someone who's going to say, well, the Arctic isn't going to melt because, you know, I haven't bo been bothered to read the literature. I've read three or four articles and papers a day for the last seven years. But what I would ask is natural scientists so a similar amount of respect for the social science, uh, which I don't see happening. And the reason what this translates into a rather naive uh, default ne neoliberal orientation, which may or may not be correct, <laughs> but there needs to be a greater plurality of suggestions about how we're going to get out of this crisis rather than the usual sort of almost AI sort of created final paragraph where people go and therefore policymakers need to do x y and z that's sociologically literate in my considered opinion because no regime is going to survive the next 20 years if there's going to be a thousand million refugees i mean my back of the envelope average having talked to a number of scholars and journalists is if there's more than 300 million refugees the world trading system will collapse there'll be the world depression and there will be regime change, social collapse, and all the all the stuff that has happened regularly throughout history are happening to Western societies. So it might be appropriate for scientists to, uh, I'm being polite, <laughs> it would be appropriate for scientists to respect the social science and say, this situation is so bad that the Western uh, neoliberal regimes will not survive as a major prediction, and they will need to be replaced by deliberative democracy formations, or we'll have fascism. And that's what the social science would, would uh, predict. The other thing is, is there's a massive disconnect between the social science and social science effects and the social implications. And one of the reasons campaigners like me are discard, discarded you know, in, the, in the media is because people don't realize that the social, the climate crisis won't be manifested through storms and temperatures it will be manifested through economic collapse i.e loss of pensions 
collapse of health services, uh, loss of general uh, law and order, and all the other things. And there is a well-established social science of social collapse. There's a well-established sociology of revolution, you know, enacted by liberal scholars. This is nothing to do with people's political opinions, but it's, you know, one of the main um, schools of the sociology of revolution is societies get to a point where they are deterministically going to collapse, you know, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and such like. And although, like, this will lead to, you know, ridicule by the powers that be, I think natural sciences have a responsibility to be a lot more objective in their social scientific predictions and less, you know, just change your policy, please, type stuff. I would love to come in. Uh, so, so let me just quickly say, um, Roger, on the whole, I would agree with what you're saying, but you're being far too general. There are too many scientists, and I think uh, Haley and I are both in this category, who do take a lot of account of what social scientists are doing and saying. And certainly in the Climate Crisis Advisory Group, yes, we do listen and carefully bring on board leading people who understand the social science. So I do think uh, generalizing is a, a little bit of a dangerous act. Um, and I don't think that Haley and I fit into the category you're describing. When I was operating for the British government in negotiations, um, I took to China and India a group of people who included uh, uh, risk experts. And the reason I did that was precisely because I know when I was a scientist just publishing science and getting my reputation up there, um, what I was concerned about was not being wrong, right? And that creates this conservative atmosphere that uh, that you're talking about. But at the same time, coming into the field of climate change and looking at it, we understand that statisticians, the sort of people who work for the insurance and reinsurance sector, are very, very good at analyzing what the risk is of your house burning down, which is why they can give you a policy uh, that will uh, enable you to recover any financial loss that you suffer. And, and they have to do that with some accuracy. And it's these statisticians that I took on that journey into China and India. And it was very, very sobering for the scientific community to be faced with people saying, what is the 0.1% chance of China's rice production failing as a result of climate change? These were the kind of issues that we were discussing. And it is very, very important. But the other angle, and I could go on for a very long time and I won't, um, the other angle that is critically important is, what? why are we failing to get political response? It's, it's not just because these guys are, are desperately trying to put their heads in the sand. Some of them are. Some of them are faced with elections and will do anything to be re-elected. I think we have a prime minister doing that right now. But what what needs to be understood is the power, for example, of the fossil fuel lobby. Nothing to do with science, but these lobbyists are spending billions of dollars to try and rubbish the science of climate change, and they've been amazingly successful. So what, what, what I also want to say is we must bring in economic experts because our economic system and our global economic system now has emerged without putting any value on our ecosystems. So what, what we need is a revolution, if I can use Roger's phrase, a revolution which will overturn this uh, economic thinking that we don't have to worry about putting stuff into the atmosphere, we don't have to worry about putting stuff into the oceans, etc. These ecosystems are a part of us. We're a part of nature, not apart from nature. And changing our economic system requires a dramatic turnover. But I'm not of the view that that's impossible. I think it's absolutely necessary as we go forward in time. So, yes, I think what we need is a good discussion, but please don't just rubbish us. A, there was a lot in those answers, um, and there are so many questions. So I, I'm going to try and fire through a bunch of them as, as quickly as possible. Um, so uh, 
Um, David, perhaps you could, or Dave, would you please answer this one very quickly? Um, the last La Nina event lasted three years. Um, is there any indication of how long the El Nino event will last for? I think the El Nino event doesn't last for more than a couple of years. Uh, normally, it's a, it's a fairly short-run thing. Um, but what we had anticipated was that it was taking off in 2024. And most of us are very, very surprised by the impact in 2023. I don't know if Haley would agree with that. Yeah. I mean, I suppose the other thing I'd say is there are, there seem to be signals already, according to my my colleagues down at the Met Office, that um, that we may be going straight back into a La Nina right. as this finishes, which, you know, there were lots of, yeah, yeah. it'll be interesting. Yeah. Um, Roger, perhaps this uh, next question is a question for you. Um, what advice would you give to people who are trying to speak to climate change deniers? Um, what would you say to try and convince climate deniers about the climate crisis? There's two There's two things to say. I mean, the, the usual approach is you reason with them. Uh, that's not what I would advise. The first, the first thing I would say is, is that climate deniers generally aren't convincible and you're wasting your time and you should spend your time engaging in action because it's action that persuades people rather than words. Uh, often they react badly initially, of course, like we often do when we're threatened, but over a period of time people come round because of the emotional impact of action as opposed to the cognitive impact of, um, of words. The second counterintuitive thing is you should listen to them uh, and feedback what they say, because most climate deniers are not um, interested from a psychological point of view in climate denial. They're trying to get it attention because they feel like they've been ignored and humiliated. So if you pay the attention to them and then... Um, repeat and summarize back and treat them with respect then they'll suddenly start to like you because you've had attention paid to you and then it will turn out that they're not actually that bothered about being a climate denier they just wanted your attention and secretly they're quite into agreeing with you which <laughs> which probably sounds like naive but there's plenty of evidence that is the case uh, i once had an interesting chat to a climate denier who was a taxi driver and it was only a seven minute conversation and I didn't contradict him at all and as I as he as we stopped and he stuck his head out the window and he said well you know what if uh, if I could afford it I'd get an electric vehicle so the psychological interpretation of that is because he liked me because I listened to him he he, he was he, his sort of inner conscience could emerge and he could confess that he actually did want something to happen so this is a purely psychological theory, of course, of why people have opinions and there's a lot going for it. I've got to say, I'm sorry, I've got to duck out. I've got another engagement. OK, well, thank you for joining us, Dave. Um, uh, if it's OK, I'll keep the panel going for another um, five, ten minutes and then we will go into uh, the poll and the breakout groups. Um, I just want to say very quickly there, um, there's a lot in this which is cause for despair. And if anybody needs uh, some climate resilience, there's a lot of good links, which Alex, Alex the tech person, has posted in the chat and you can check out. Um, a lot, uh, my next question, uh, which is based uh, from what Frida said, is there was a lot of talk about hope. Um, how do you frame hope? Because obviously we see a lot of false hope, um, like calling COP28 a uh, a great step in the right direction, which it clearly wasn't, and false hope is quite dangerous. I personally believe that hope comes through action, um, but then there's a lot of um, cognitive dissonance of the action being sign a petition or to stop genocide, and it just doesn't quite work. So how would you frame hope in the context of the climate crisis? Who would like to answer that first? Um, it's, it's, it, it, it's tricky. I mean, Every time I I give up any any type of public talk or you know normally if you're in a in person panel or something people people's questions aren't about the science people's questions are exactly as you say they're about what they can do so it's always um, 
you know, coming back to what Roger said about the electric car, it's always, always about what they can do to help. Um, and so I think part of it is giving people that, uh, you know, t telling them what they can do to help um, in terms of feeling like they are acting in the right way, feeling like they are um, helping to to try and solve this, this huge crisis that we're all in. Um, at the same time, I think that, you know, we really do need to make these systemic changes to the system. Um, the individual actions aren't enough, actually. Um, so it, it's got to it's got to at some point come from either the financial world, the economics, basically forcing change, which may happen, actually, um, because it may become too costly um, to use fossil fuels. And but whether that will happen before before we see extreme impacts is is debatable um, or it or it will come from from government. Um, but but that's looking unlikely to happen. So it is quite difficult to give people hope. I think that um, that we will see significant changes. I suppose the hope that you can give um, are that you know some some of the technologies that we need are there, um, but they're not there at the scale that we need. Um, but I would argue that with with increased investment, um, you know, if if we all decided. Or the people who who have the skills and and they had the resource to actually work on this, then then we could make significant strides and significant changes very quickly. Um, but it needs the political will and the economic financing to actually to like make that happen. Um, so we should have hope. We should have hope because we could change. We could turn it around. Um, but but it's it, yeah, it's it's making that happen in reality is is the difficulty. Anything you want to add, Roger? Yeah, well, <laughs> this is a great subject, isn't it? Like, uh, I mean, one of the, uh, you know, just coming back to the sociology of, of climate scientists, as you might say, is the culture of climate scientists is, is sort of embedded in, a, in, in, in various cultures. And one of those cultures is the obsession with hope. And every client, almost most climate scientists, well, sorry, I won't put every climate scientist into one bucket, but I would say eight to ninety percent of climate scientists are simply sociologically illiterate on the literature on hope. So the literature on hope is goes as follows: providing hope to people does two things: it dampens action and it encourages action. So you need to have a sophisticated analysis, right? It dampens action because people go, "Oh, there's hope. I don't need to do anything." <laughs> And then it encourages action because you think, oh, there's hope. Great, I'll do something. So it depends upon the culture and the personality structure of the listener, right? So that's the first thing, right? You know, social science is complicated business. <laughs> you know, it, it's not really that determinant of whether people do things or they don't. But what is determinant of whether people do things in communication is is the um, is the um, is talking in an authentic way in other words not bullshitting and that's the biggest determinant of whether you get people to do things whether they trust you whether they, they think you're bullshitting them or not and this this is the biggest that that's the biggest issue and arguably one of the reasons why i'm influential is because people know i don't bullshit people you know if i thought human extinction was was you know absolutely going to happen i would say so but i haven't i'm said i'm saying we're heading towards human extinction and I think that's what all natural scientists should say, because that's what's happening. You know, it doesn't mean we're definitely going to end up there, but we're certainly heading there. Uh, we shouldn't be saying, you know, we're cut or whatever the euphemism Sir David said. Now he's gone, I can say this. <laughs> you know, we're heading for like billions of deaths. Please say it, David. You know, come on, Hayley, say it. We're heading towards billions of deaths. Right. And that's our responsibility, not scientists, but as human beings and as citizens. The last thing to say is, is that there is a massive reason to think that all this is going to turn out in a very interesting and pro-social way, which is that the, the neoliberal regime has basically fucked up so badly, they basically destroyed everything they believed in, including capitalism. Capitalism's going to collapse under the weight of its own contradictions, as someone once said. You know, not because of some social process, because of physics, right? The world economic system is going to collapse 
there's almost no doubt about that if we're going to have hundreds of millions of refugees. That is going to open up a massive potentiality for pro-social, structural, transformational change in the human condition, psychologically, spiritually and materially. And that's happened many times before in history when communities have faced existential challenge. They either go extinct or they fundamentally change their culture. And everyone on this call knows what the agenda is, right? <laughs> you know, what we're trying to do. And there's a massive opportunity to actually enact that over the next 30 years, to bring people together, provide social solidarity, and to actually work together to do the geoengineering slash carbon emissions and bring about equality. And all those things go together. So far from everyone going in despair that we're all dead, actually, we're going to enter into the most interesting generation, you know, next three or four decades are going to be the most interesting in the vert commas decades in human history without a doubt so you know just get on with it <laughs> that's the message <laughs> get on with it well I, I think i can keep this panel going for, for another hour at least but um i i think we're gonna have to to end it there and um we're going to break out groups and some of the, the discussions can continue there um uh, the breakout groups are completely optional, but please do fill out the poll beforehand. There's been a lot of interesting conversations here about how to talk about the climate crisis if we're still, um, you know, using too many uh, big words, if we should be alarmist or if we are just raising the alarm. So I'm really glad that we're able to have um, this discussion. Um, and please do keep the questions coming. Uh, maybe uh, we can type a few answers back. As I mentioned before about the different actions you can take with Just Stop Oil. So one of the ones I'm gonna mention um, is donate. Um, the only reason we can keep going is because we have ordinary people donating about um, the amount of money they would get in an hour of work uh, once per month to Just Stop Oil. So if you make 10 pounds an hour working at the supermarket, if you're able to donate 10 pounds a month to Just Stop Oil, that makes a huge difference in making sure that we could just keep going because without persistence, we are not going to make the kind of societal changes um, that we need, that we're talking about in terms of convincing everybody and um, degrowthing. De um, the other things that are there uh, is take action. Where the next action phase is going to be in several months. Please join. Um, we, but we also need a lot of volunteers. Um, but we can't do this without people behind the scenes organizing calls like this, um, ringing people up, um, there, there's there's a lot that needs doing, so please help out where you can. And the last thing is to join us on Signal. Signal is how we communicate. Um, it's basically a more secure WhatsApp. So if you can, please install Signal um, so that we can communicate with you more directly and more easily um, from the get-go. Um, Alex will post a link to how to install Signal. Um, but there's a lot more information about Just Stop Oil there, and people will happily take your questions about Just Stop Oil in the breakout groups. Um, about, well, it's the can of worms, but I want to talk a bit about the, the solutions to the climate crisis. We've talked a lot about how devastating the issue is. We know a lot about renewables and insulation and free public transport and degrowth in general, but is there anything that either of you would like to add about how we can try and mitigate um, the climate crisis and societal collapse for both the UK and reduce our emissions for people who are already suffering around the world. There's, as I see it, there's two things which have maximal effect upon what needs to happen to stop billions of people dying. The first one is for people to enter into civil resistance, which is what Just Stop Oil are doing. In other words, for there to be mass civil disobedience there's massive evidence that that's most effective and people are probably aware that it's been successful in Holland in stopping uh, the the, um, the subsidies for fossil fuels and there's overwhelming evidence that it works. Um, the second thing is we need to change the political system and to do that we're working in the UK on holding assemblies that will lead to a national citizens assembly uh, run by society itself not the government and that will lead to a national alternative institution that can accurately reflect the views of the British people as a sort of preemptive step towards 
a change in the constitution. In other words, a change in how decisions are made, which is the fundamental aim, I think, of what we need to do over the next decade. It's actually changed the ways decisions are made in our, in our governments. And that means changing to citizens' assemblies for reasons many people know. So they're not mutually exclusive, okay? <laughs> you can do both. You know, once a year, go and get arrested. Rest of the year, you know, go door knocking. Uh, but sitting around doing nothing isn't going to solve the problem. And it will also make you miserable. Because there's overwhelming evidence, isn't there, Alex? Action cheers you up. <laughs> it does indeed. It does indeed. So just be self-interested and selfish and do something. Because doing nothing isn't very clever. That's a great um, note for Alex to open up the breakout groups. So thank you, everyone, for sticking this along. And um, this is your chance to discuss what you've heard.